evening. It is such an honor to be here tonight. And uh, and we just have been so excited and inspired to come and talk to all of you. And at the opportunity of building an alliance with CAGJ's supporters and uh, participants, um, we feel that many of our of our values that fuel our, our work within tribal communities really align with CAGJ's work. And it's moments like these where we can come together in solidarity that really help strengthen the work, the work of global justice and um, cultural healing all over the place and in so many ways. So um, it's an honor to be here tonight. And you know, we were talking about how for us, um, working in tribal communities is not as global it's actually really local. It's actually more local than the local <laughs> because for many of us, our, our mentors and elders really carry knowledge that's uh, deeply rooted in this land of this place and um, provide us with the gift of, of a sense of place. And, um, and many of those people are among us tonight, so we're really excited to see all their faces and um, to have their presence here with us. But um, yeah, they carry this this knowledge that's steeped in the roots of the land and this infectious love for our environment and for our tribal people and for our deep food traditions. Um, and that such passion really pushes us to, um, to honor the gift of food, to respect their spiritual teachings, and to build a food system, not just for, for us today, but for those who have yet to come. And so I believe that the love that they carry is sacred and that it's a gift that's been given to them through our ancestors. And, and it's a gift that allows them to, to live their lives as revolutionaries. Um, and that really inspires, inspires us to exercise our own revolutionary potential as well. Um, and and in so many ways, our honored guests are the cultivators of tribal food sovereignty. We quite often feel like we stand on the shoulders of giants, that these people are, uh, have provided such a wonderful living legacy for us to become a part of, and that that's really a gift uh, within our own work. So, um, so what is food sovereignty? Um, for us, tribal food sovereignty is really about decolonizing our diet and revitalizing our traditional food systems. And it's not about... And it really isn't that new of an idea, you know? In fact, um, my ancestors who gathered with uh, Governor Isaac Stevens 160 years ago to sign our treaties, the very first thing that they talked about was access to food for their people. They wanted access to all of the elk, all of the deer, all of the salmon, the fish, the shellfish, the roots, and the berries. So even at the core of tribal sovereignty is food sovereignty. And our ancestors knew that if we always had this access to our foods, to our traditional foods, that they would feed our spirits and would remind us of who we are and maintain our cultural identity. And that's what food means to us. And that's what my, my mentors and the people that are sitting right here at our tables teach me every time. Um, so tonight we're going to share with you um, so um, I'm like realizing that there's no image behind me. <laughs> we have all these little photos for you to look at. Um, but tonight we want to share with you, you know, a little bit about about this cultural renaissance that's happening within tribal communities throughout the Salish Sea, and every day I'm learning more and more about what's happening across Indian country, that, that more and more tribal communities are taking charge and really working towards um, revitalizing their traditional foods and their traditional food culture. So um, we are honored to, to be able to witness this work as we travel throughout the, the Salish Sea, and, uh, and we're gonna share with you a little bit about our work and where it came from, and um, and the people who really helped hold us up and have helped hold us up for a while. So it's amazing for me to look around the room and see all the faces of our mentors and colleagues and coworkers, and just to feel so 
humbled in your presence. I can't even tell you um, how touched we are that you all would come and join us and to see all these little faces of people who are doing good work. And tonight is a party. It's the height of summer where we're able to look back at the work that we've done, look at all of the seeds that we've planted, our sweat and our labor, and to really take that in and digest it. And so uh, we're really, really happy to be doing that with you and to have you here. And for our mentors and our elders and our colleagues, um, we're so humbled to be in your presence and know that you've been doing this work longer than we have. And so the best way that we can honor you is to talk about you. You know, talk about some of your work and talk about the models and the lessons that we have learned along the way. So we can um, go to the next please. slide. Yeah. You can't see your paper, right? Right, but that's okay. Right. We can work on the I think we'll be okay. We can. We have each other. We'll remind each other. Um, and we're gonna get the slideshow going here, so you can see some of our images. Back one slide. Can you all see the images that are up on there? We can turn this off if that's all right. Okay, great. So um, we're going to talk many, about many of our honored guests, and one that is no longer with us but that I have to mention is Bruce Miller or Sovier from the Skokomish Indian Nation. And I had the great honor of getting to know Bruce in 1998, and some of his family members and dear friends and colleagues are here with us. And when we talk about revolutionaries in the food movement, there's no one that I want to speak about more than Bruce. He was such an innovator and a carrier of many gifts. You know, Bruce really carried uh, knowledge. And one of the things that he taught me that was really powerful was that he used to say, don't teach all of your children the same thing. If you teach them all everything the same, then they won't meet each other and the world will fall apart. And so he practiced that. Uh, he was a spiritual leader and a carrier of did basketry and storytelling. He was a plant person, a food person, many, many gifts. And he gave each of those gifts to different people, you know, his different family members and apprentices and colleagues. And so now, um, even when he's gone, we see that his teachings are living on. We see that his breath is living on. And that some people do basketry. Some people leave. Some people know how to harvest the foods. Some people know how to prepare the foods. Some people know how to harvest the medicines and prepare them. Some people know the spiritual work. And now all of those people carry those different gifts and they need each other. And that's community, right? We all, each one of us in this room has a gift. And no one of us can be everything. And so one of the best models of food sovereignty for me has been that teaching of Bruce. That if things go really bad, I don't want a gun. I don't want a bunch of canned goods. I want friends who carry a lot of different things. So Bruce taught many of us that, and, um, and we'll be talking about some of the people that he worked with. And um, he was such a renaissance man regarding traditional foods and medicines, and always had people from all over Indian country in his house. He started a, a garden. Um, he brought back the first food ceremony at the Skokomish Smokehouse. And, um, and did it, you know, he was all, always outside and I was really lucky to be with him in his kitchen or out harvesting. And uh, at that point, you know, this height of this cultural renaissance that was happening in Indian country, despite all of the hardship, you know, despite all of the, the hardship of colonization that people have survived, that there was and is this incredible emerging force, this living culture that continues. And so, um, 
At that point, Susan Gibbon Seymour, who is Val's and my director at the Northwest Indian College Cooperative Extension, was really listening to what people were saying in Indian country. And Susan, uh, one of my mentors and very, very dear friends, um, has an incredible gift of listening. You know, she really listens to the people and builds programs based on what she hears. And so at that point, after Bruce passed in 2005, um, she and her husband, David Gibbon Seymour, who's our grant writer and also our dear friend and an incredible writer, um, secured grants to create this traditional foods and medicines program. And because we didn't have Bruce at that time, we decided that we would create the program in his teachings and let many people carry it and let many different tribes um, host classes around traditional foods and medicines um, so that these gifts could be shared, so that this knowledge could be shared and this revitalization could happen. And so our very first class, which I believe is the next slide, was at um, Macaw, the Macaw Cultural and Research Center. Teresa Parker um, is the person who coordinated that class. And, uh, and we didn't know how this was going to turn out, you know? It's like, all right, we're going to invite all these people from different tribes. Our Northwest Indian College traditional plants crew would do some of the teaching, but we would really highlight what is happening in the community. You know, what's happening at EMA? Who are the teachers there? What are the gifts? And this is Teresa here in front of their ethnobotanical garden. So she shared that with us. And then the next slide, I believe, is a picture of um, some of the foods that were shared at the table. Um, and we had over 50 people from many different tribes come to that first gathering. And there was um, halibut chowder, which is amazing at Mia Bay. We had uh, gooseneck barnacles, mussels, clams, oysters, of course, salmon. Um, you can see some of the baja, which is the horsetail fertile shoots, salal berries, sprouts of salmonberry and thimbleberry. And uh, one thing that I had never tried before was herring roe on eelgrass. And the elders, this was a gift from Bella Bella that someone had brought down, and the elders from the Bay piled up this, um, this seaweed that was covered in fish eggs and twirled it on their forks like it was spaghetti and ate it um, with such excitement and vigor. I was beside myself to see this. And it was a taste like I'd never experienced in my entire culinary life. Um, but you could see uh, the, the excitement, you know, the, the feeling in the room was palpable as these words, these traditional words came back to others, as they told their stories about having these foods when they were young people. So something so special came into that room when we realized at that point, so much of this work is about food and about bringing back these traditions. It's a living part of the culture, and it's essential to maintain that cultural integrity, to preserve the language, to preserve the foods, to preserve the stories. Next slide, please. So, every now and then, when you're really lucky in your life, these people come to you with these open arms and this big spirit and bring you in. And that, to me, is Hank Gobin and Inez Bill. Um, and they're right over here in our corner. I'm so happy they're here tonight. Um, absolutely. And like any good revolutionary, you need a good comrade. And when I think of Bruce, I think of Hank as a comrade. <laughs> He's got that spirit and has taught me what it means to dedicate your life to a cause, to giving back to your people. Everything that Hank and Inez do is infused in making a better future for the Tulalip tribe. And I can't tell you the wealth of knowledge that I gained just sitting with them and listening to their stories and their dedication <laughs> towards, them, towards creating a better future for people and to create these spaces for people to be able to share their gift. So in many ways, they have been visionaries for our program um, and have helped us out with, with uh, several projects that we're going we're gonna to talk about here in a minute. Uh, next slide. Another 
comrade of Bruce would be Roger Fernandez, who is also going to be up here tonight, sharing stories with us. And Roger's an artist, he's an educator, he's an activist, he's a storyteller, and has really helped us look at the teachings of, of the stories, what's in the stories, and has, has, how has that guided our work um, working within tribal communities. And so constantly pressing us to think of the analogy of, of what the salmon people have to offer us, and the analogy and the metaphor of what the beauty that the cedar tree brings into our work. So um, we're very honored to be working with, with Roger Fernandez as well. This is Feeding the People, Feeding the Spirit, the book that uh, Elise and I co-authored, but really we, it was more of a collection of, of stories guided through sitting for many hours with Hank and Inez and Roger and um, many other people within our, our network of folks. And, um, and this book has really become a testament and a guiding light to help us uh, with our you know, food sovereignty initiatives and our, and our work within tribal communities. It's, it's ultimately like I said, a combination, a collection of research findings, but um, but also really infused with you know community. It was based out of a community-based participatory research project. Wow, big words. Um, but it's you know this way of looking at research where you actually listen to what community members are asking for and you respond to that. So and out of this has come many many action plans. Um, we were able to to ask people what some of the barriers are to accessing traditional foods. And are you accessing? What are you accessing? What are you eating? How do you cook with these foods? And more importantly, what are the solutions to overcoming some of those barriers? And so just having this nice chunk of, of um, ideas from community members from throughout the Puget Sound um, has really helped fuel our work and pushed it forward. So this is our beloved uh, Elaine Grinnell, front and center here and laughing. And um, Elaine's going to do our blessing for our dinner tonight. But one of the parts of the Feeding the People, Feeding the Spirit project was to um, develop recipes and to bring together recipes that were inexpensive, easy to use, highlighted traditional foods. And so we brought together about 20 um, native chefs and had this incredible cooks camp. And Elaine was one of our cooks. And uh, and we've learned so much from her. Elaine is an amazing storyteller, elder from the Jamestown community. And, um, and one of the things that she always brings to the table is laughter and joy. She brings that to everything that she does. You can see that here. And it's one of the cultural teachings that when you're cooking, you always bring good intention into your cooking. This is something I guess has also really taught us that what we're feeling, uh, the intention that we're holding becomes a part of our food. And so there's nobody that I would rather um, eat their meal than Elaine. <laughs> Thank you for being here. And So this is our dear Rudy Reeser, who also was one of our cooks at our traditional um, cooks camp. And Rudy has been one of my mentors from um, the very beginning of my working in Indian country. And um, he and his wife, Leslie Korn, run the Center for World Indigenous Studies and the Center for Traditional Medicines. And I did my master's work with them. And Rudy really helped me throughout uh, learning how to work and teach in Indian country and how to do these programs where the community really owns them. He has incredible knowledge, um, but he also has an incredible spirit and really charges us to reach out and to um, be as big as we can and to fuel this movement beyond our imaginations. And so, um, Rudy, I thank you for everything that you brought our, brought our program and brought my training. And 
So Val and I are going to talk about our two projects. In addition to the Northwest Indian College Traditional Plants and Foods program that we do where we're traveling throughout tribal communities, and we've been doing that since 2009. Um, and at this point, we've had over 65 classes that have been hosted by 17 tribes, many of them multiple times, and it's built this huge network of people who are really doing good work around restoring native food traditions. Um, and so in addition to that program, Val and I each carry a program through the Northwest Indian College. And so one that I've been carrying since 2004 um, is the Northwest Indian Treatment Center Drug and Alcohol Program. And um, June O'Brien, also one of my mentors and dear friends, was the director of the treatment center for many, many years. And she's the one who had the vision to bring traditional foods and medicines into the program. Um, it's a 45-day inpatient program. We serve Native people mostly in the Northwest, but throughout um, the whole country. And it's such a special place in that it treats Native people within their culture. It's not recolonizing by trying to superimpose a different culture or a different tradition onto people. And so we have a sweat lodge, we have people from many different spiritual communities that come in, we have elders who come to teach, and, um, and it was really through June's vision that we brought in the traditional foods and medicines program. And so we work with patients every week. Uh, we have several different gardens. And, um, and June, you know, believes that many addicts are canaries in the coal mine, that they have spiritual gifts, and that when they can remember who they are and remember where they come from, that they become incredible healers. And they have the capacity not only to heal themselves, but also to heal their families and their communities. And I can't tell you how many times I've seen that in our work there. And so she taught me to teach in a way that um, honors each of the patients. And instead of teaching them something new, what we're doing is trying to help them remember. Remember where they come from, remember who they are, remember the gifts that they carry. And it's amazing how you can put huckleberries in front of somebody, or um, eelgrass, or camas, and you see their, their memory come back, and the language come back. And they say, oh, I used to harvest this with my auntie in the mountains, and it tastes exactly the same. And you see their spirit flood back into them. And so that is what we're holding at the treatment center. And June has since retired and is now an incredible writer um, and, a, and a writing mentor to me. But, um, but what she's created there is really incredible and lives on. And um, so this is a picture of one of our gardens, the Medicine Meal Garden. We also have a traditional foods garden. And in the next slide, um, I believe that um, there's a picture of some of the patients making medicine. And so we try and make the knowledge there as hands-on as possible. Because you don't learn things through books. You don't learn them through the internet or through someone telling you. You learn through doing it. Or at least that's how we learn. The people we work with learn best. And so we try and give people the opportunities to go out in the garden, to plant seeds, to harvest, to make medicine, and to make food. And I could not do any of this but my dear colleague, Elizabeth Campbell, who's featured in the next slide, um, and is one of our honored guests. And um, Elizabeth is a farmer, she's Spokane and Kalispell, and came into our program just as a participant in the traditional foods program, and kept hanging out, and, um, and eventually started working in the, at the treatment center program and through our traditional plants program. And she, um, she gets really nervous about teaching and speaking, but she's an incredible teacher. And uh, it's been amazing to watch her bloom and to feel so held by her. There's no way that I could do this work without her. So. so um, in 2010, I started the, the Muckleshoot Food Sovereignty Project. And this initiative was really inspired by the work that um, that we had done with the, the book Feeding the People, Feeding the Spirit. And also, at the time, I was 
helping Elise do this research, I was also training at the treatment center with her. And one day, we were out in the garden, and every Friday we take the patients out to the garden, and they're always like dragging their feet, kind of complaining a little bit. And then by the end of like 30 minutes, they're throwing worms at each other and laughing and having a good time. And so, you know, this time had passed, and um, I was digging around in the garden, and I looked up, and everybody had gone inside except for me and three other people. And those people were muckle shoots. And I thought to myself, how can I create something like this in my own community where people can come, they can put their hands in the dirt, and really experience the teachings of, the, of what the plants have to offer us. And so the Food Sovereignty Project is, um, is inspired out of all of those things. And we do uh, community food assessments, which is what you are we're looking at. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Um, so we do food assessments. We've created a, a traditional food map of Muckleshoot with the um, input of educators and cooks and elders and administrators and hunters and fishers and gatherers. Um, and so with all of this and with the wonderful support of Annie Brule, who I'm sure you've all heard of, um, who helped design the book that you're all looking at tonight, um, <laughs> who's an incredible map maker and illustrator um, and graphic designer, helped pull, it, pull together a map along with the incredible talent of Roger Fernandez as well. So, um, so we've created this food map that went out to um, to our community members to help them navigate their food resources within our community. We've also maintained and installed several uh, educational uh, gardens, and I do not do this work alone. Um, I have a really wonderful, gifted gardener. I am the first to say I, I can't grow anything, but this man, Miguel Hernandez, who I went to high school with, <laughs> is really gifted at growing food. So he is our community gardener for the project. He works for the plants program as well and just carries such an amazing ability to open up space for people to feel safe and to not feel challenged or scared to go out there and garden, which can be really scary for people who have not done it before. How do you put a plant in the ground in the right way? So Miguel provides that safe space for them and I'm so honored to work with him every day of my life. Another wonder of mine is uh, Warren King George, who is also here tonight with his wonderful partner and also wild foodie, Betty. Um, and, and I cannot tell you the, the, me, what it means to me to be able to sit with this man and listen to the stories that he's collected. He's dedicated his life to being a historian for the Muckleshoot people, and he works a lot. So whenever I feel tired, because I work a lot, I think about Warren King George out there working constantly as well. He's also a busy man, and it's very inspiring to me to continue my work. So, you know, think of those people when you're laying in bed in the morning, you don't want to get out and <laughs> do anything. I think of the cooks, I think of Warren, um, and I think of, I think of all the people who have really committed their lives to making a better future for people. And, um, and then, Okay. Um, and then, you know, just to wrap up, the one of the other people who I would not be able to do the, the food sovereignty work without is my mother, Wendy Burnett, who's also here tonight. So far, she birthed me, so that's awesome. Um, and she's also just her entire life. You know, we used to we used to live here. With, that's her, yeah! That was Mother's Day. Um, but, you know, my entire life, she's always made food something to celebrate. And I feel like that's so infused in the work that I do because I get so excited. I feel often like Elise calls me a cheerleader sometimes when I'm doing a food demonstration or something because I just want people to be really excited about food. And, and I remember as a little girl, my mom taking me to Pike's Place Market and saying, Valerie, apples are in season, isn't it great? And we'll celebrate that apples are ready. And even if all she had to cook for us was this quick pancake mix, it was a 
celebration that we're eating pancakes three days in a row. You know, it was, it was, food was always something to be appreciated and to really, she was the true teacher in teaching me how to honor the gift of food, I think. And to this day, helps me carry the work um, through her work as a manager for the Muckleshoot Senior Program. So I'm very grateful to my mother and, um, and also to Elise and the wonderful people that we get to serve and work with. So um, I feel like also, <laughs> we were like saying, we're going to go on and on and on about how grateful we are to people. But, but you know, uh, a year ago, I really wasn't that excited about Facebook or the web, the World Wide Web. It actually really terrifies me. Things can just go digital and virtual everywhere. And that's just kind of scary. Um, but we have these wonderful artists uh, that we work with, Victor Pasquale and Tracy Rector. <laughs> innovators, and they help us feel safe and think through all the unintended consequences of the things we could be dealing with. And, uh, and that's just been so, such a blessing to work with them. So I'm going to hand it over to so I want to mention Tracy in particular because she has been with our program since the very beginning, since 2005, and worked closely with Bruce Miller on a film called The Teachings of the Tree People. And Tracy has just bloomed as an artist and a filmmaker. Um, and she has a company called Longhouse Media and works with Native youth to capture their stories. And I have known many of these youth who have created stories, and it's incredible to look through their eyes. You know, she'll, she'll help them to produce the story, but um, she works with emerging storytellers. And uh, what's come out of that is incredible. And what she's doing right now is a film called Clearwater. She's actually in a fundraising um, Kickstarter campaign right now over the next two weeks to gather funds. And Clearwater is about saving Puget Sound. Um, it's about um, our waters of the Salish Sea and how important they are and the, uh, the incredible gifts that the Salish Sea carries. I know that that's something that touches each and every one of us. Um, and for the people that we work with in tribal communities, this food is our lifeblood. You know, these foods not only are really nutritionally um, much higher than anything that you could buy in the grocery store. You know, it's like we could talk about huckleberries and how dense they are in antioxidants and salmon and how high it is in omega fatty acids. But even bigger than that is we hear um, our elders and our teachers saying that these foods feed people's spirits, that they're absolutely necessary to preserving culture and to maintaining culture that the language, the songs, the stories, they're all wrapped up in our relationship to place. And so Tracy um, is going to be interviewing tribal elders, um, fishermen, um, looking at the dead zones and the acidification of Puget Sound, and really charging people to do what they can to save our precious resources. And so I encourage you to check out Longhouse Media um, and she'll be upstairs um, if you're interested in talking to her about that. But just um, Tracy, for me, epitomizes uh, that incredible hard work and service and devotion and passion that it takes to fuel a revolution. And every single one of the people that we've talked about, they are revolutionaries. And there are many people here that we didn't mention that we also hold our hands up to and uh, honor your good work. So it's amazing to be here amongst all of you and I hope that you enjoy the food and enjoy each other.